Today's Gospel, obviously, is a continuation of last week's Gospel when Jesus first returned to the synagogue at Capernaum and he took the scroll from the book of the prophet Isaiah and read to them precisely the very idea that he had come to preach the good news to all the sick, to all the lame, to all those the poor of heart, the anami, if you will, of Israel. Here today, he continues and he takes it a step further. He tells the people in the synagogue that the word of God is being fulfilled in their time, in their eyes, for all to see, for all to hear, for all to know that the love of God is with us. Emmanuel is with us and he has come to bring us the good news. The good news that we are called to live in continuation of our call of God, the Shema of Israel. Why? Word, if any. Did you possibly see that connects all the readings that have been given to us today? What word do you think would apply? Come on, I know you know it. Love, of course. Love. It begins with the prophet Jeremiah. It is beautiful to know that God created our soul with his very own hands. And that he did so with the greatest of love for each and every single one of us. I have known you. I have formed you from before you were in your mother's womb, says the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah. I have consecrated you, consecrated you to me, to the Lord, to the very essence of who I am. And the essence of God is love and is mercy. And it is to that love and to that mercy that we have been consecrated to the Lord our God. And the reason He has consecrated us is because He calls us to be prophets in His name. When we have been baptized, when the water has been poured forth on us and the prayer of the Holy Trinity given, the priest immediately goes with the oils of salvation, the chrism oil with which the kings and priests are anointed. And he goes to the crown of our head and he traces the sign of the cross with the chrism and he relates to us right there and then that we have been called to be priests, to be prophets, to be regal as the Lord our God through His beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is High Priest, is High Prophet, and is King of Kings. And in that same manner, St. Matthew at the end of his Gospel reminds us of what it is that is our mission called in life. Go ye to the ends of the earth, baptizing in the name of the Holy Trinity, and teaching not imposing, teaching all that I have taught you. The prophet teaches the love and the mercy of God. And he tells us, armor yourself with me, the Lord our God. For when you armor yourself with me, with my love, nothing and no one can ever defeat you. For my love will always be there for you to defend you, to bring forth your message. No matter what trials, tribulations, and pains you go through life, you can do it because I am dwelling you as I have called you to dwell in my love. And so he tells the prophet, Jeremiah, who is known 
as the prophet of doom, the prophet of trials and tribulations and of pain, he says, I want you to go with my mantle of truth and confront the kings of Judah with his court, even the high priest of the holy temple at Jerusalem, and tell them to trust and rely in my ways and not in those of men. For if we trust in the ways of the world, we are doomed to failure. It is only when we trust in the way of God that we can succeed in this life. And that very theme is then picked up by the psalmist who reminds us that God will sing of our salvation. Of our salvation. Our salvation will be sung by the angels of the Lord throughout all eternity. Because God does not seek our destruction, but our redemption, our salvation. And then St. Paul. St. Paul picks up the theme of Jeremiah and of the evangelist Luke in his first letter to the Corinthians. And there is a call to unity in Christ. We see that in the very first chapter of this letter, when he calls us to the unity of God and the unity of God is founded precisely at the end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 13, which we heard today, the call of love. For of the three theological virtues that God has gratuitously given to us, it is the virtue of charity, the virtue of love that is supreme to all because it is the expression of the very essence of whom it's God. That particular second reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians is one that we probably have heard zillions of times every time we attend a wedding. I have yet to meet a bride that has not used that call of love as part of the readings on her wedding day. Because it is absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. It gives us a sense of peace and it joins us and reminds us of who we are, where we come from, where we're walking to, and where our life is destined to for all eternity. To the indwelling love that dwells in God our Creator. And then comes St. Luke. And St. Luke began his gospel in a continuation of last week's. The proclamation of the very purpose for which the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ came into being with his birth and now his very public ministry throughout Israel. He calls us and he immediately reminds us of the essence of God in a very subtle way. In a very subtle way. Because in bringing to our attention the needs of the Anawi, Jesus is reminding us of God's call to Israel. Shama Israel! You shall love the Lord your God with all your mind with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, your brother, your neighbor, as yourself. It is that call to the neediest of the neediest, in whatever need form there is, that God desires for each and every single one of us to respond to. And yes, the people in the synagogue at Capernaum, they were amazed at the impact of the way he proclaimed from the readings and teachings of the prophet Isaiah. But now, here comes the little serpent trying to enter 
through our Achilles tendon. For all of us have an Achilles tendon, of course. And so it begins. In Spanish we call it cizana, the planting of weeds, of doubt. But isn't he the son of Joseph? Isn't Mary his mother? And aren't those his sisters out there and brothers? Well, he thinks he is. Coming here, how arrogant to remind us of our duty. Because that is what has been expressed in St. Luke's Gospel. How dare he? How dare he? And Jesus, very calm, knowing that he must endure whatever the Father desires often to endure in this world. He tells them, no prophet, no prophet will ever be welcomed in his home. And that sent them off. That certainly sent them off. Because immediately what he did was exactly what he did with the Samaritan woman. He confronted them as he confronted her with her truth. Here you are, you hypocrites. Here you are. You bikers, here you are, you arrogant people who call yourself worthy of God. This is your truth. This, what you're doing right now. You are paying lip service to the Lord our God, but in your hearts, that does not belong to God. Because if your heart belongs to God, then you will know how to love for one another as God loves you. Then you will see the needs of the brother and the sister and you will immediately go and attempt to take care of it. Because the need is not always an economic need. There's an emotional need. There's a psychological need. There's a need of not being biased, of not being prejudiced, of not marginalizing those whom we are called to love at all times, which is everyone. And that is what Jesus was trying to teach and confront them and us. Imagine. Imagine. Do we honestly think that we can have a relationship with God that is based on a quid pro quo basis. I will do this for you if you do this for me. Is that what we think? No. The love of God, which is the Greek word that is used to describe the love of God, is agape. It is a selfless giving. There are no conditions. Because the essence of God is given to us gratuitously. There is nothing that we have done, are doing, or can ever do that would merit the love of God that we receive. What does He ask of us? He tells us very clearly in the Shema of Israel, love one another. As I love you, says the Lord at the Last Supper. As the Father had reminded us, love your neighbor as yourself. When we put the gospel of love really and truly into play, coming from our hearts, we become invisible. In our time, we have known many trials and tribulations. This last century has probably been one of the most atrocious of centuries. It began, it began just slightly over a hundred years ago with the First World War. A war 
that was that we saw of the arrogance of men, the inhumanity of men against men. It was about power, it was about control, and it involved all of Europe and the Americas. And while that war was supposed to bring an end to all wars, it didn't last very long, as we know from historical teachings. For within 20 years, we were at war again. And the atrocities of the inhumanity of men against men were even greater then as it was in the first war. And through the entire 20th century, humanity has pushed itself to the brink of doomsday. But for the love of God, because He really and truly walks with us and sustains us in His love. But have you also noticed that amidst all those trials, tribulations, trying and painful times, how His love has persevered? How do you look at the modern advances that humanity has made? Do you see them as a half empty glass? Or do you see them as a half full glass of water? Because when you think about it, in the worst of time, He has given us the tools so that we can go and approach Him in our minds and in our hearts through reason and through faith so that we can find them and find solitude in our hearts. Yes, the world continues to be in great need of the love and the mercy of God. These continue to be difficult times. And because they are, the more so then that we are called to trust in the ways of God. This year, we have in our own hands the political destiny of this the greatest nation on the face of the earth in modern times. Let us discern with our minds, with our heart, with our soul, and with every strength of our being, whom it is that we believe can better die in a Christian, moral, Judeo, Christian, ethical, moral manner, a way of life. Let us take the time to reflect who it is of all the candidates out there 